Now, without further delay, may I present to you Dr. Alessandro Schiavo, Consul General of Italy to Hong Kong and Macau, on bringing Botticelli to Hong Kong. <laughs> Dear friends, first of all, let me thank the FCC for organizing and for hosting this lunch, and all of you for being here today and for your interest and participation. I'm really happy to have been invited. Do you, can you hear me in the back? Yes? Yeah, okay, good, thank you. I'm really happy to have been invited to this um, uh, talk to be able to speak about two projects which are very dear to my heart. The first one is the book on the history of the Italian community, which is the first one to have ever been written on our community. And the second one is the, the Botticelli exhibition, which is currently held at the Hong Kong U Museum under the patronage of Mrs. Pensiho. Uh, I began to cultivate these two projects in my mind soon after my arrival to Hong Kong in mid-2010 because I realized how old and how long-standing and also how important um, our ties with Hong Kong and Macau are, and yet how much little known um, our contribution has been. And also became, because one of the factors which, have been, which affected me the most, which affected my order of priority the most, was the realization of how much Italian culture had been for a long, long time uh, quite underrepresented in Hong Kong, especially if you compare it with the, um, the volume, our trade volume, which is really the evidence of a considerable success. The Italian exports to Hong Kong are much higher than the ones to South Korea, Saudi Arabia, India, and Brazil, which are all very very important partners for us. And, and yet, we, uh, you know, Italian hearts has been a little bit absent from the Hong Kong cultural scene for a long, long time. So I began to cultivate these two dreams, uh, to promote a deeper awareness of the value of Italians, of the contribution of Italians, and of the great potential for our cultural cooperation with Hong Kong. So basically, uh, these two uh, projects um, wish to convey uh, some very few simple messages. And this is also why we created the Italian Cultural Institute two years ago. Now, the messages we wanted to convey are Italy is here. We are devoted and committed to promote more of our, you know, um, our culture here in Hong Kong. We do so because we, are really, we really want to uh, start a dialogue with the Hong Kong people because we believe that the Hong Kong is not only a place to exchange goods, but also a venue to exchange ideas. And then culture is really fundamental and instrumental for the progress of a, of a society, of a given society. In other words, we think that Hong Kong deserves a richer and wider and more diversified cultural offer. And we, are really, we really wish to share it with Hong Kong people and with, it, with its youth. But some of you may ask, why did you choose this Botticelli uh, painting, in particular this painting, uh, to start this process? The, the, the answer is that because we, didn't, we couldn't possibly think of a more beautiful, more significant masterpiece to share with the Hong Kong community. I mean, this painting, okay. this painting is a true icon of Renaissance. And uh, it is a true icon also of Italian art. And Renaissance was a unique time in history when painters were discovering perspective out of the new belief that man could dominate nature and space. Philosophers, music composers, uh, painters and sculptors embellished the life of the many republics in Italy, which at that time were gaining more and more economic power. They were trading with the rest of the world, they were funding the best, you know, the first banks in Europe. And they were creating you know, a movement of rebirth, because this is the actual, the real meaning of the word rinascimento, renaissance, rebirth. They were creating a movement of rebirth which really brought about a real and profound um, explosion of art, which was destined to spread out, uh, spread throughout all Europe, and also to um, have a, a deep influence uh, and act as a source of inspiration, even in our day and age. So this is the meaning of Renaissance for us. The cradle of this literary, uh, philosophical, and artistic revolution was Florence, where geniuses of the caliber of Botticelli himself, of course, but also Leonardo da Vinci, Brunelleschi, Donatello, just to mention but a few, were giving start to the new era of civilization and of hope for the entire mankind after the somber Middle Ages. 
Sandro Botticelli worked at the court of Lorenzo il Magnifico, the Magnificent. Lorenzo was a descendant of the rich and wealthy Medici family, one of the uh, most powerful in Europe, which created, which had the, the biggest bank in Europe at the time, with branches all over the continent. And they owned a, a textile industry, which at that time employed 10,000 workers. Lorenzo was a, a poet, a music composer, a philanthropist, and a patron of arts, and of course a brilliant diplomat and a, you know, one of the greatest statesmen in the whole history of Tuscany. Practically, you know, the Medicis were the most cultured, the most privileged, the most, you know, the wealthiest and uh, uh, most powerful um, family in Tuscany and also in Italy at, the same, at that time. And they kind of they were the personification of the golden era of Florence. And also Lorenzo, who was, as I told you before, you know, a poet himself, drew inspiration from this very beautiful lady who is portrayed in this painting by Botticelli. So she was a real, a very famous lady at the time. She, she had a name. The name was Simonetta Cattaneo. She was born in Porto Venere, or maybe she moved there when she was a child. Porto Venere is an ancient uh, and very nice village, charming village by the sea in Liguria, which was known already in the ancient times as the Porto Venere, the Portus Veneris, which literally means the harbor of Venus. What a rare coincidence for a lady to be born in Porto Venere, a lady destined to embody and personify the ancient goddess. She was very beautiful. When she was 15, she got married with uh, Marco Vespucci. Now, this name may be familiar to some of you. He, Marco Vespucci was a distant cousin of the more famous Amerigo Vespucci, under whom, name, under whom America is named. The Vespucci's were another very famous, wealthy family in Florence, and they were allied of the Medici's. So when Marco and Simonetta moved to Florence, because of Simonetta's beauty, you know, they, they kind of became the, the, the core, the heart of the life also, the courts in, uh, in, um, in Florence. And even if she was married, I mean, you couldn't look at her, she had blonde and golden hair, gray and greenish, melancholic eyes. In a few words, she was irresist uh, irresistible. Uh, so many, many young men, even if she was married, couldn't help, um, couldn't resist courting her and pined for her affection. Among this, there was Botticelli himself, who depicted her in this masterpiece, but also in many other paintings. Okay, for example, this is the spring by Botticelli, and Simonetta is the, the one which the figure, the female figure, you know, giving the back, the shoulder to us, one of the three grazie, one of these three figures dancing. And uh, in, in many other uh, paintings of that time, you know, these are also portraits by, of Simonetta uh, drawn by Botticelli. And again, another painting by Botticelli. But you could find actually a figure, a, re, a face in many, many paintings of that time, another, another Simonetta Cattaneo. She was really very, very famous. She was considered a sort of top model of the Renaissance, the beauty of Florence. And so among the people who fell, the men who desperately fell in love with her, there was also Giuliano de' Medici. Now, who was Giuliano? Giuliano was the younger brother of Lorenzo the Magnificent. And he fell so desperately in love with her that he decided to take part in a very dangerous tournament in which he really actually you know, risked his life uh, just to win, uh, to receive a surprise, a banner with the figure, the portrait of uh, Simonetta drawn by Botticelli himself with the inscription La Sans Par, that is to say the lady with no equal. And Giuliano managed to win this, this tournament. Now, this is, this is all history. This tournament, tournament is historically documented in many books of the time. We know everything. We know when, when it took place, how long it lasted, who won it, how the, the gentlemen, the noblemen were dressed. We know that they were you know, wearing garments and jewels and purse, which costed a fortune. And Simonetta was proclaimed uh, the queen of the tournament. But so the, the love story between Simonetta and Giuliano, which soon became a love legend in Florence, you know, and made also fantasize people in Florence for many, many decades to come, uh, 
probably remained only platonic because of course, I mean, just let's remember we are in Italy in the 15th century and of course the social ethics of the time would have not tolerated a different ending, so just platonic. And by the way, the neoplatonic philosophy was the one which, which was dominant at the court of Lorenzo the Magnificent, so what a very famous philosopher, I told you, there were sculptors, painters, musicians and philosophers at the court of the Medici. One of that was Marco Ficino, neoplatonic philosopher. Anyway, so this love story had to be remain platonic. For example, when Botticelli drew this banner, thinking also of Giuliano, Simonetta was looking at the sun. The sun was the symbol of glory and of, it, we don't have a picture here, but we know everything because it was described in the books. The sun was the symbol of glory and virtue. And Simonetta was not looking at a Cupid, which was a little angel of God, which was defeated and with his hands tied to a lovely tree, a, a, an olive tree, tied with, by, you know, by golden thread with a, an, an arch and the arrows broken at his feet. So Simonetta was married, there was nothing to do with it. Everybody loved her, and everybody were, were absolutely crazy over her, but they couldn't really, really fight for her. When Botticelli died, he expressed in 1510, he expressed only one wish, to be buried at Simonetta's feet in the Church of Ogni Santi in Florence, which has been frescoed by Ghirlandaio. Ghirlandaio is another famous painter of the Renaissance who also depicted Simonetta many, many, many times, like Verrocchio, like Filippo Lippi, maybe names which do not tell you anything, but they are very, very famous in Europe and in Italy. So, uh, I mean, I, I kind of, you know, I f I f forgive me, please forgive me if I made all this very long digression about the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the tournament and everything, but it was also to uh, answer some questions which were made to me by some students in Hong Kong. They asked me, how comes that Simonetta uh, is naked? Uh, you know, it's a very clever question, you know, wasn't it provocative, you know, to paint a nude, f female nude at that time? You know, Italy was obviously a very, very Catholic country. People in the Renaissance, they were quite um, secular. They, it was, again, as I told you, after the Middle Ages, they began to open up their minds. And also, but what happened is that they began to look at the classic times, the classical times, the ancient myths, um, uh, because they, they began to find a new confidence in themselves. So, so they began to look back at history in history because they wanted to uh, recapture the glory of former uh, of Rome, of the ancient Rome. And they, uh, whereas during the Middle Ages, all the classical myths were considered as a sort, as a fruit of paganism, of course, you know, all these gods, you know, and uh, nothing to do with monotheism, so they were condemned, even if people continue to study you know, the classical uh, books. Uh, during the Renaissance time, rich bankers, tradesmen, noblemen began to draw inspiration from the glory of Rome and ancient myths were considered compatible with the Christian ethics and they actually they considered them as the anticipation of the Christian morality. Uh, as you know, as I'm sure you know, this is, you know, the, uh, the uh, Simonet, the Venus that we brought to from, from, from Italy, from the Galleria Sabauda, which is very similar to the birth of Venus, which is permanently showcased in the Uffizi, but which could never be on loan to a foreign museum. It's like more or less, it's the same masterpiece. Botticelli really repeatedly painted her. But, so the same Venus, the, the other famous the masterpiece is the birth of Venus, so if Venus, who is just born, so she's pure, she's simple. Her nudity has nothing to do with sexual, sexual attraction. She just represents the purity of the Christian love. According to the Neoplatonic philosophy, um, uh, love was the engine of the world, was something, was something which could approach, make people and men get closer to God and also to a deeper human knowledge. So there was nothing wrong. On the contrary, if man managed like Giuliano to control his lowest in instincts, love could actually be instrumental for deeper knowledge. Now, uh, I'm sorry the image is cut, but the, the, the Simonetta of the birth of Venus comes out on a, you know, of the waves um, of the sea, on a seashell. Seashell is one of the symbols of pilgrimage and also of Christianity. So the idea is that as Simonetta is born from the form of the waves, this is the Venus, the birth of Venus according to the classical myth, men are reborn pure 
uh, after the immersion in the christening font. So there is a lot of religious uh, idealism also in this painting. Now, of course, you don't have to, uh, to read, it's not necessary to read this painting through this kind of philosophical knowledge, but the idea is that really this is compatible with the idea of Renaissance and with the depiction of perfect human bodies, uh, which have full plastic volumes, but at the same time have almost lost uh, some of the attributes of their humanity because they are so perfect that they are not contaminated by reality. Here Venus is really, Simonetta is really pure, simple, nude, but really in the sense of pure, and she's so perfect that she is untouched by life, by evil, by sadness, by bad experiences. And this is another feature of Botticelli. In San Sebastiano, you see this is a martyr. Uh, but nothing to do with realism. There is no sign of physical suffering. You know, the, 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 the flesh is the arrows with our, which are jabbed, and his flesh are an offense to his youth and to his beauty. But it remains pure, he's not suffering. He's, he's, uh, he's, um, uh, he made a sacrifice, but in a way he's not untouched by it. This is the idea of also of the perfection of the body. I, I'll try to, you know, to not to take too much time and maybe I can come back to this, this uh, concept later. Now, just to come back to Simonetta. Simonetta died when she was extremely young. She died when she was only 22 or 23 years old of tuberculosis. And uh, the, the, the strange thing, another coincidence, is that she died exactly on the 26th of April, 76. So, two, um, uh, 1476. Two years before the death, the assassination of Giuliano. Uh, and when she died, uh, a huge crowd lined up uh, at her funeral, uh, just to, um, and lined up before her casket, which was left open to allow everybody admire her beauty for the last time, a beauty totally untarnished by, by death. Her premature demise, her premature death, probably has also strengthened, contributed in strengthening um, her figure, her meat. And after a half a millennium, she is still uh, live uh, alive among us, so, uh, so much alive that the Italian authorities in the year 2001, 2002, uh, selected her image, her very, very iconic image on the, for the uh, 10 cent coin of the Italian euro that you can see there, it's, it's absolutely her. And she's still an icon and a muse because Botticelli has made her immortal. When she died, Lorenzo the Magnificent, so the great statesman, um, wrote her a poem, as I told you before, likening her to a star. A most the most beautiful star of the sky, with embellished the sky with her own splendor, so much that she made all the other stars look pale in comparison. Now, I... I, so I, I hope uh, that I, I managed to give an idea of why, which was this masterpiece, uh, to start this process of dialogue with the Hong Kong community and to launch this message that we're really the only thing that Italy, uh, one of the things that Italy is really expecting is to promote more art and more Italian culture in Hong Kong, not only for the sake of Italy, but really because we really want to contribute to the richness of this, of the cultural life of this beautiful city. And now let me please uh, tap briefly um, into the other project which is dear to my, to my heart. This, this book which we have written with the collaboration of, the, of Angelo Paratico is not here with us today, but also of Gianni Crivellera who is with us today. Please Gianni, raise your hand, don't be shy, it's shy, okay. And um, then I thank him for being here. And um, so not many people were aware of the fact that uh, some of the first Portuguese expedition, expeditions to Asia uh, were financed by Italian banks, for example, or, or of the legacy that Italian people had left on the icon of Macau itself, that is to say the um, St. Paul's Church. Uh, that church uh, is actually a product of the uh, Italian vision. It was not uh, commissioned or built by the former Portuguese colonial power, but um, it was um, commissioned by Alessandro Valignano, who was a very famous Jesuit, one of the first to arrive, first ones to arrive to Macau, and probably the Italian man who had the biggest influence on Macau is still buried in the crypt of the St. Paul's Church. And the, all the other, the architect of the church was Spinola. 
for another Italian, and the people who worked at the church for to, you know, to make all the sculptures and everything were also directed by Giovanni Cola, who was another Italian, who founded in Macau the first school of painting which blended the Eastern and the Western styles. Uh, so 130 years, the more famous Castiglione, who, who was uh, one of the famous painters of the, uh, the court of the uh, Qing Emperor. So uh, not only did Valignano ask to build this church, which remained for a very long, long time uh, the largest Catholic monument in, uh, in East Asia, but also ordered the construction of the first university in East Asia, the, the College of St. Paul, which, which you know, at that time was just uh, by the side of the church. And it was a, a first place for intercultural dialogue, with, where missionaries from Japan, uh, Italy, India, Portugal, Spain uh, could meet, uh, could learn the local languages, and familiarize with the local um, cultures, and generate new knowledge. Now, Valignano was the first one who said that the church had to be Indian in India, Japanese in Japan, and Chinese in China. Uh, this means that his uh, reading of the word was so modern that he was the first one to understand that in order for the church to be successful, or for any diplomatic Western you know, diplomacy to be successful, the Westerners, the new people, had to be the ones who had to fit into the local culture and not the other way around. So all these people, Valignano, Matteo Ricci, uh, Michele Ruggeri, and by the way, Valignano was the one who asked to Matteo Ricci, Limadou, and Michele Ruggeri to learn Chinese because the church had to be Chinese in China, therefore they have to be Chinese. So all these people were, again, just to mention, you know, for time, these people, just for time concerns, they were the advocates of the so-called suave method or accommodation method, which meant we, shall, we have to recognize the local culture as equal. They immediately understood that China was a very ancient civilization which needed and deserved to be respected. So they came to China and to Macau uh, as friends. Now, um, and they were the ones to understand that the intercultural dialogue, which is today recognized as the very basic and essential tool of any successful diplomacy, they were the ones to coin and actually implement this philosophy of uh, soft power over 400 years ago. And uh, the, 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 what I want to stress now is that all the Italians also came after uh, Valignano, Limadou, and Michele Ruccieri. Uh, so the, the Italians were the first sinologists of the, of the Western world, of the whole world, the first ones to study Chinese and write a dictionary between Portuguese and, and Chinese, so between a European language and Chinese. All these people uh, have been also, have had very, um, uh, very good descendants in a way. All the, also the Italian people who came, the missionaries also who came to Hong Kong many, many centuries ago, built here hospitals and schools, among which I take the pleasure of mentioning the Canossian schools. And they, you know, in the more recent times, uh, the Pime, some of the Pime fathers uh, also built in Hong Kong uh, some homes for the disabled and founded the famous Fuhan Society. It, is, it, is, it has a local name, but it was founded by Italian people. Uh, an Italian priest in Hong Kong in the 50s even invented the instant noodles. Not the noodles, of course, the Eastern noodles. And thus deserving the title of uh, noodles priest, of which he was very, very proud. And then uh, also the modern businessmen, uh, who you know, are not as famous as the people I've just mentioned, uh, came here with the same spirit of friendship. And, and they're all participants to the same spirit of friendship and fascination that the Italians have always felt for this, this part of the world. And what is striking, according to me, is that we never, we never try to brand all these creations, uh, you know, the dictionary between in the European language, which was not Italian, Portuguese, and, and Chinese, or the full house society as, uh, as Italians. We were simply content of doing the job, of doing something for the local community, and to hand it over to the local community. Thank you for the attention. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Wow, I never knew all these stories behind the famous face before. Um, we have um, about um, 15 minutes left um, for Q&A. Um, um, I'm going to ask my uh, fellow board member, Cami Yu, to, to kick this off, um, because I think you've, you've got a burning question for Alexandra, didn't you? <laughs> I do have a burning question. I mean, of all the treasures that you could have chosen um, 
from all the, the repertoire of Italian masterpieces to bring to Hong Kong. Um, what would you bring to Hong Kong if you could? Next to me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, we, we are already preparing a second exhibition and we hope, I mean, we, 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 we definitely want it to be as beautiful as this one. And we are thinking about something completely different from Botticelli. Botticelli was a master of idealism, as I told you before. Uh, perfect bodies, you know, almost, you know, so human, but at the same time also uh, so perfect, they do not look almost human anymore. So we, we will try to, find, to bring a master of realism. Uh, just to you know, to give you uh, and to the Hong Kong public and the youth the idea of the diversity of Italian art and culture, and also uh, so another master which uh, who actually opened the way for modernity, so for modern painting. Still, is a nation master. We, we do not want to start with contemporary art. We would also do so, but we, we, we really want to bring some rare masters which are normally very very difficult to bring because of insurance, uh, security concerns, and everything. Because I think the job of the consulate you know, Italian Cultural Institute is to bring, you know, to try to win hard challenges. Uh, but it will, be, it will be totally different from Botticelli, not from Renaissance, in the, let's say the era, uh, the period which came soon after, something uh, as great as Botticelli, but absolutely the opposite of Botticelli. How intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> um, questions from the floor, please. Um, would you please will raise your hand and then um, one of the staff will bring the microphone over and it would be great if you would also um, give us your name um, and tell us who you are. I saw a hand over there on the left. Uh, my question concerns the wider future. Now the Italian consulate, thanks to your great leadership, has brought this beautiful work of art here and you have perhaps plans to bring other works of art. But in many other countries of Europe, for example, not only Europe, there are collections of art, some of items from which could come here. Is there any room for manoeuvre for the consulates of other countries to join with you, join your start, to bring, in fact, the joint exhibition, one picture from each country of Europe on display to Hong Kong? Okay, no, this is something which I'll, I mean, if I had enough time in Hong Kong, I'd love to do it. Uh, I'm afraid I would not have enough time. I will go, I think, after summer or soon before summer to somewhere else. But uh, we did, we, we, and I contributed to organize something like that at the Quirinale Palace, the Palace of the Presidency of the Republic in Rome for an important anniversary, actually for the signing of the European Constitution. So some years ago, we decided to bring one masterpiece from each country of the European Union to Rome, where the treaty was signed. Uh, so I've, I've done it already. Uh, it's very challenging. It's extremely complicated, and it takes a lot of effort, because this means that you don't only have to negotiate with the cultural authorities of your country to bring out a masterpiece, which is very complicated when you're trying to bring something precious and ancient. But, uh, but you have to deal also with 28 countries, uh, which, is, which is quite, quite ambitious. But it is something which can possibly be done, and maybe the EU office could take the leadership for that. But um, it, it is extremely complicated. So now my ambition, since I know that I just have a few months left in Hong Kong, are to prepare a second exhibition. And if you, if you, have, if you really believe, and I'm sure you do, because otherwise you wouldn't be here today, that we are doing something useful and precious for the Hong Kong community, please say, say it, because we need uh, some encouragement, not only funding, of course, but also some encouragement. The response to this exhibition has been very, very positive so far. We, uh, we definitely want to do more to promote our culture, but not only our culture, culture in general. And culture is the product of many different uh, countries and civilizations. It cannot be the monopoly or the duopoly of a couple of countries. It must be culture, the cultural panorama to be real, to be true, to be, to be effective, must represent a variety of countries. If you have only one or a couple, then it's not enough, it's not true culture, it's partial culture. Next question is coming from Tara Joseph, FCC's president. Thank you so much uh, for telling us about all of this. And I'm just curious behind the romance and the beauty of the painting and bringing it here, it must have been very, very difficult to actually bring something of such value over. How long did it take and how painful was it to actually make it happen? It was quite painful sometimes. We, we, we worked night and day for this, for this project. Uh, it was, at the end, it was less difficult uh, than 
what we expect in, uh, if we look at the Italian authorities, which were really enthusiastic about the project and really helped us. I mean, at the end, we organized this exhibition in only a few months. Normally, you take one or two years, at least one year, but probably also two years. We wanted to do it immediately we, when we learned that we had this chance to bring this masterpiece to Hong Kong. And then we, we kind of set a very precise and short deadline for ourselves. But yes, it has been quite a challenge and, and despairing sometimes to find venue and funding and all the permissions. A lot of paperwork. But the paperwork at the end was the, um, the, the, the least complicated part. It's more difficult to find venues in Hong Kong. Of course, you don't have, at least for now, uh, a lot of cultural venues. And um, so that was maybe the main challenge at the beginning. So I'm a happy, I, I really believe and hope that this, this exhibition will pave the way for a different awareness uh, to see the Hong Kong people asking for more. It's quite shocking to know that you had diffi great difficulty in finding a venue for Botticelli. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, any, any other questions from the floor? Either about what the portrait, ah, the lady over there on the left, please. Grazie, Alessandra. <laughs> you know that I'm a very big fan of my Italian heritage and culture. <laughs> uh, what is, oh, well, one thing, I think it explains the story of Simonetta, it explains, uh, I believe, Salman Rushdie's uh, Enchantress of Florence, the story of Simonetta in, in that as well, but I could be wrong. Um, my question is, what, how has the tourism from Hong Kong to Italy, going through your office, as you might see, mm -hmm. been increasing over the years? And is there more awareness of the Italian culture and the desire to travel to Italy to see the cultural aspects, not just shopping? Okay, thank you. I, well, we Hong Kong people do not need a visa to come to Italy, and um, so I mean it's difficult to say yet because normally the people who need a visa, are, for example, the mainlanders, so who normally ask visas and the other consulates, Italian consulates in China. So we don't have uh, you know let's say relevant data, uh, but but I do think that you know when you promote culture, uh, you actually are promoting the whole country. I mean, to promote culture is the most effective way to brand a country, because you're really speaking directly to the hearts and minds of people. You're really saying, hey, this is my country. And uh, I mean, this painting speaks so much of the culture of Italy because it speaks, it tells the history of a nation which has been founded on art and culture. You know, our identity is founded on that. And this is why Italian design or architecture or Italian fashion is so beautiful or successful because it comes from all these great masters of the past and even to, you know, the times of Rome. Um, so I, I do not have data, you know, about the touristic flows, but I'm sure that this is all positive. It, it, it does help. Also trade, also you know, a deeper awareness, you know, more um, deeper bridges between the two societies. So it, it does help for sure. All aspects of bilateral relations. Just wonder, how about the other move, uh, the other direction? Are there a lot more Italians living in Hong Kong yes. today <laughs> compared to say, you know, five years ago? How many more? Yeah, when I came here, so three and a half years ago, we were 1,800 something, and now we are 2,800 officially registered. So um, it's a lot, it's a very big, big growth, and they, they continue to come. And then not only the dimension of the Italian community has changed, but also uh, the, uh, the composition of the Italian community. We have more and more you know, young people and young families, therefore having more children and enlarging the community. Young professionals who come here, whether in their 20s or 30s, Right. Whereas before we had more people arriving here between their 40s and 50s, so they were a little bit more, let's say, mature in their in their career. So many, many more, uh, and many more will come. I think I'm sure. Presumably, it's to do with the difficulty of getting a job back home. Possibly. Also, yeah, this is certainly um, for sure the economic crisis. Uh, let's say is helping in this direction, but also because we in, and I also think that after the signing of the um, agreement for the avoidance of double taxation, which was signed the last January, this will help more Italian companies to come to Hong Kong rather than to other cities of China or of Asia. So yes, the crisis, the fact that the economic power is shifting to, to this part of the world, and um, uh, the fact that our trade is improving, is growing, as I, as I said before and, uh, and yes and this agreement also so mm -hmm. um, any questions for Alexandra about the 
history, in the 500 years of Italian history in this part of the world, perhaps? Maybe it's a, it's a cheeky question. Um, the French came up last year with 150 years of uh, Hong Kong-France relationship. And now Italy comes up with 500 years of Hong Kong, uh, uh, Italy uh, friendship. Who can next beat uh, you? Which country? I, I guess Portugal? I have no idea, of course, it's up to them. I do not want to suggest them to also beat us. So you, ho you hold the record for them. <laughs> but it was, it was funny because when I talked with uh, Arnaud last year, before, just before his book was coming out, and I told him I'm writing this book, and he was really looked at me and said, really, what, are you doing something like that? And he was, uh, you know, so understandably um, surprised. Uh, well, we did not write 500 years in the title because we wanted to be the French. It's, it's simply, we thought it was a nice title because, I mean, book, I'm not sure how many of you will read the book. I really hope all of you, or at least a big, big majority. But um, there is a message in the book. Uh, we are here, we have been here for a long time. So at least the, the, the title is quite effective in delivering the message. So uh, it is true, uh, and we wanted it to, to be quite um, Im immediate. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not for the famous uh, healthy competition between Italians and their uh, very close uh, brothers or cousins, whatever you prefer. But it's really, you know, we, we had the same idea, which proves that we are, why we are neighbors. <laughs> Let me remind everyone that you can pick up um, your own complimentary co copy of this book near the exit over there. Uh, we have time for one more question. <laughs> I'm always curious. Um, a few months ago, we actually had a talk at the FCC about how it's so difficult for art to flourish in Hong Kong and why is Hong Kong so behind. But you mentioned that things came into place quite quickly, mm -hmm. although we have no venues that are appropriate for these types of um, exhibitions in Hong Kong. What's your sense? Do you think Hong Kong is really developing quickly into a, a place for art? Well, I think Hong Kong is developing a lot. Uh, since it is difficult to find venues, we wanted to really find something which was impossible to say no. I mean, when we proposed the Botticelli, all museums were interested. The thing is that, of course, each museum has a very long-standing program, a very old one, and then uh, sometimes they, they cannot adjust very, very quickly. Um, the reason why also we are bringing one piece only is, well, first of all, because it's easier to explain to the public. You just have to focus on one message instead of, uh, you know, a wider exhibition and uh, and second because we we thought it would have been easier to find space and value for only one piece rather than for 10 or 15 or 20 pieces or 30 or whatever and uh, so, but we still, it was not easy. But yes, I think Hong Kong will, is developing. I hope it will develop much, much, you know, faster. There is a, a sensibility maybe to, to cultivate and to, and to help grow. Once again, we need your help. It means to say it, must, it cannot be something imposed from above. It must be, and, I, I, and we wish it to be as a result of the dialogue. So the more the Hong Kong community has, and the Hong Kong press has a big responsibility in this, pushing the authorities to be more sensitive and building, you know, more about um, educational in terms of scientific education, but as the development of the human being, therefore humanities and studies like art and history are essential. The more this city will have a very bright future, because at the end, what what is what distinguishes Hong Kong from other fast-growing cities in Asia? I mean, you are many many cities which will you know are threatening sometimes Hong Kong or in any case other you know. Playing a very very strong competition, at the end is the cosmopolitan character of the city. So the more you have a mixed culture, the more you have a cosmopolitan culture, the more you will keep your strength. Oh, that's my opinion, of course. Here, here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alexandra, for coming so to the Thank club you. today. And um, I've got a little souvenir for you oh, to take away. Thank you so much.